I'll just start the ball rolling. Um, the reason why we, or, or rather uh, Richard and I, we were talking about this um, Trace Together token, right? And um, it's something really exciting for both the cybersecurity and the free and open source software uh, special interest groups at Singapore Computer Society, particularly when um, the government technology agency, they organized a teardown a uh, teardown event on the 19th June with uh, four experts and open source advocate, advocates to look at the Trace Together token. And um, this really has changed the kind of complexion in the industry, right? When cybersecurity and open source seems to be different topics, uh, but um, because of this COVID situation, we have seen a confluence of these two um, very interesting areas come together in a very um, good and um, well, it's a good way to address cybersecurity, but also to actually address the, the, the concept of trust, the trust in technology and uh, the trust that people have in the technologies that we are rolling out because of this new normal, this situation. So today, uh, I'm very happy to be able to be in the midst of experts. Uh, and uh, I'll just quickly go run through uh, some of this, uh, well, to introduce to them. Um, Matthias Yo is the, uh, also a member of the cybersecurity chapter in Singapore Computer Society. He's the co-founder and uh, chief operating officer of uh, Momentum Z. I hope I got that right. Momentum Z, uh, a company in Singapore. And uh, our esteemed panelists, of course, uh, I'll start with Richard. Richard Ko is the chairman of the FOSS. FOSS stands for Free and Open Source Software. Uh, Free and Open Source, sorry, SIG, the Special Interest Group at SES. Uh, he's also the Area Vice President uh, Asia of Confluent. And of course, uh, not forgetting uh, the main man, Sibaram, uh, who is the Chief Technologist and Architect from uh, ASEAN Red Hat. Um, of course, Harish Pillay, the, the other uh, expert in the house, is also uh, online. So I, I don't know whether we will be able to hear from him later on on some of his comments. And uh, Dr. Tan Mei Wei, uh, she's the Honorary Secretary of the Cybersecurity Chapter at SES as well. And uh, in a day job, she's the Cybersecurity Specialist uh, of the Cybersecurity Group at GovTech Singapore. So I'm really excited to uh, be here. I hope you are too. And uh, I'll hand it over to Matthias uh, for a very interesting uh, webinar again. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, we're going to start our session now. Uh, I think this is going to be a very exciting session. Uh, because we have a very good, I mean, when we were having a private conversation, there's so much discussion that we have and it's like we have just have endless discussion about what SMEs can do, what everyone can leverage on in this, uh, uh, I mean, this, this, this open source and what cybersecurity you need to be uh, aware of, uh, especially when we are talking about this COVID season. So just a few uh, housekeeping. The main purpose or the main objective of this session is for a discussion. It's not really just uh, focusing on presentation. We want to get as much experience from the panel rather than going through a deck. So what I want everyone to do is that when uh, we will share a, a, a five to 10 minutes presentation from each panelist to set the stage, but the purpose is so that you can spark off concerns and discussion that you want to do. So please feel free to ask any question throughout the webinar, post it in the, uh, the Q&A. Your Q&A will be seen by us. So don't worry, just ask any question because we really want to uh, extract uh, and squeeze all the experience from these panelists, okay? So uh, let's have a fun time. Uh, we, the main purpose is uh, really to have a lively and engaging discussion. With that in mind, uh, I will pass it on to uh, Siva, who will be the first uh, uh, speaker for the session. And then after that, uh, we will uh, continue on for the next 30 minutes. Then after that, uh, we will open up for sharing and discussion. Okay, thank you so much. Siva, take it away. Thank you, Matthias. This is correct. Okay. Uh, firstly, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for attending this session uh, jointly um, uh, organized by SCS, uh, the FOSS and the cybersecurity uh, chapters. Um, I'd like to uh, be, uh, I guess, thankful to Richard and uh, Shafi for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in Red Hat for pretty much my, what, 14 years and in open source, uh, pretty much my entire career, uh, starting with uh, being a developer, then uh, moving into kind of a pre-sales solutions architect role. And uh, now, uh, well, doing a chief technologist role, now becoming a senior manager for solutions architecture in the region. Um, uh, fair bit of knowledge in open source and fair bit of experience uh, working with uh, Singapore companies and the government uh, across these many years um, and 
actually had the honor of working with Harish and, and some of the other Red Hat folks to actually bring open source into uh, the government. And I thought uh, this topic was actually going to be a really interesting thing because for the first time, uh, we have actually initiated an open source project in Singapore. But what more can we do, right? Um, but first, uh, what is open source in the first place, right? Um, today, the internet itself, and you talk about uh, the internet age where digital, mobile, what have you, right? The different forms of interaction that we have with one another, it has all been powered primarily because of open source technology. Uh, I know it's a sweeping statement, but uh, it is actually quite true. Uh, without the concept of open source software, um, Ultimately, the internet wouldn't be what it is today. People wouldn't be able to share data as much as they can uh, share information in any form or, not, or other, right? And that's primarily because of what you see at the top right-hand corner, the LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, PHP, uh, as a stack for software uh, that is used to power tons of applications in the past and present, right? Um, open source is, uh, I guess, a concept, right? Um, and it is really about the software that the source code is actually um, made readily available to people who want to use it or people who want to download it, right? It can be modified and used, right, according to the relevant licenses for open source. I'm not going to go into the various different licenses that might require a few days, but uh, but there are a few licenses that are available uh, for people who develop in an open source manner uh, and want to release it in an open source fashion, right? The onus of the software, and this is a common misconception, right? Just because it's open source, there's still an owner, and the owner is usually uh, the original author of the particular software, right? It could be a company if that particular person works for a company and has released the rights to the company, but that said, it's usually the original uh, authors of the software. Uh, but one thing is that it evolves, right? And project leads, software project needs, people who actually work in the open source space, some of them may not actually be the actual owners, right? But they could be the project leads in that particular uh, software. Uh, so what's the difference between open source and proprietary software, for example, right? Uh, in the proprietary world, you talk about the, the plethora of applications uh, available. Uh, generally, source code is not made available, right? Um, and source code is not owned or it's owned by the vendor and the vendor only, right? No one else can see the source code. Why, what does this mean to us, right? Why should we care? Um, ultimately, what open source enables is that today, if I want to create a project, let's say, for example, to address some specific issue uh, with COVID, right? I want to actually release it as open source so that potentially I can get a lot more people on board to help develop that software, not just necessarily for my own company. I, if my software is attractive enough, I can attract people from other companies or individuals, anyone, right, uh, to actually co-develop that software. This means that projects can be released faster. More features can be released to the market faster, right, via the project. Um, and also, um, I can actually in inspect and contribute to the software. What do I mean by inspect? Uh, there's a lot of concern with security and open source, right? And if you are a developer, uh, I can actually read the source code to examine it for potential security flaws and what have you, right? Granted that most of us don't, but we have the ability to do so. And the fact that, you know, people like, you know, Google, Red Hat, IBM, uh, even Microsoft today, uh, they actually have security teams looking at open source software to identify potential bugs that can be then addressed and released in a uh, released faster, right? Uh, ultimately, all this really leads to faster innovation, right? You talk about the digital world, right? Um, and first to market usually wins. Um, the faster the innovation, the faster I can release features to the market, the faster I can actually attract my consumer, yeah? Um, Ultimately, from a security standpoint, um, the concept of open source, right? Uh, I can actually identify vulnerabilities easier. And the identification of vulnerabilities is not limited to me. And the rectification is not, related, uh, is not limited to me or my company. It's actually anyone and anyone can actually rectify it and release that piece of code uh, to the project which will then be accepted. Uh, it's not limited to the vendor per se. And that's really the power of open source um, that 
the or should I say the open source development model. Okay, so, so this is interesting, right? And I like to use an analogy here. Um, so during Circuit Breaker, right, um, everyone became a chef, right? Uh, and like, I think most people here, I, I myself tried to cook, right? And in fact, I tried to bake uh, in, in that sense, right? Um, and, you know, as much as I tried, and it was a very simple orange cake, not the best, uh, the best burnt cheesecake, but it was a very simple orange cake uh, that I tried to, you know, use a recipe that I found from the internet. I bought all the recipe. I got the eggs, the butter, the oranges, and, and stuff like that. And for some reason, it never came out properly, right? Uh, very similar to that of open source, right? Um, today, there is the source code out there, right? Anyone can go and download the source code and look at the source code and try to build the thing. But many of us just want to buy the cake and eat it. Ultimately, we want to bake the cake because we want to eat the cake, right? Um, and, and as such vendors, there are vendors out there that actually provide that baked solution from a software perspective, right? Uh, of course, Red Hat being one of them, right? Um, uh, what we do is that we kind of take that bits and manufacture it and bake it for you. Uh, it's like akin to drinking water from the reservoir, right? Uh, any of us can go to the reservoir, Macritchie or wherever. We can go there, take a glass, take up the water and drink, right? But what will happen? Uh, has it been treated and stuff like that? You don't know, right? And you bear the risk. Um, similarly with open source, right? Um, you know, just blindly taking software from the internet, uh, for example, and just consuming it like that, you don't really understand the risk uh, behind doing so, unless you really do that in introspection of source code and stuff like that. Um, that's it, you buy mineral water, right? Mineral water from Evian or Ice Mountain or what have you, right? And you drink it. And that gives you, I guess, a form of, uh, assurance that I'm actually drinking treated water, I can, it's actually safe for me to drink. Uh, and that vendor who provides that mineral water gives me that assurance, right? Um, and this is a very important concept when it comes to open source, right? Uh, we release open source software. When a developer releases open source software uh, to the general public, he releases it as a project. Right? And I want to emphasize that it's actually a project. What this means is that the developer is actually being the author of the project or the owner of the project. He releases that source code onto the various sharing mechanisms, whether it's GitHub or whatever, right? Um, and he participates in the active development of that project in the open source space, right? This, if someone else from my company or some other uh, organization, some other country, uh, they like what they see and they want to actively contribute towards it as well. They are able to latch on to the project, develop additional features and potentially contribute it back to the original project, right? Or they could also potentially fork the project and create their own version of that project. That's perfectly possible in open source as well, right? Um, and ultimately, what this means is that generally, when you want to release a product, as in that Ice Mountain bottle, that Evian bottle, or what have you, right? You have to add a few more components to it to make sure that it's actually consumable uh, by commercial users, right? And as such, there needs to be a lot of integration testing of potentially various different components to make that particular software work properly, right? And ultimately, what the vendor provides are really products, right, that are stabilized for commercial usage. And that can be attributed to liability, right? That means the vendor himself is liable for the software that they ship to the customer. Uh, and the customer can then rely on that piece of code to make sure that I'm safe, my business is safe. If there's a bug, the vendor will be responsible and accountable for the bug fix or the security fix or what have you, right? So that's kind of in relation to what a product is. And we shouldn't confuse a project and a product, right? Just because a software is available as a project on the internet does not mean that it's directly consumable from an enterprise perspective. You can, once again, it's possible, uh, but that said, you need to understand the risks behind doing so, right? And that's where their vendors, uh, once again, Confluent Red Hat as two examples, but there are many other vendors out there who provide commercial support to open source software. 
Okay, some misconception on open source, right? And and uh, I always like to uh, go through this. Uh, many people have this con misconception that number one, open source means free software. Yes and no, right? Open source means the source code is actually free, as in freedom, right? Uh, versus free as in cost, right? Um, generally, open source software, you can get the source code for free, right? Generally speaking, not all the time, but depending on the license. But that said, it's more about the freedom to actually use the software in the way that you want to use it, right? The freedom to actually co-develop the software or contribute back to the software um, features that you want, right? And that's how, you know, tools like, or software like Linux, for example, OpenStack today, the biggest flavor of the month uh, would be Kubernetes, right? Uh, container orchestration solution, that's all purely open source. And it wouldn't be that today without the massive amount of contribution, not just from Google, who actually owns the project, uh, but from people like Red Hat, from people like uh, Microsoft, from people like uh, VMware, for example, right? Um, all of these people or organizations have actively contributed to various open source projects, right? And they then productize their own versions of that software. Uh, so does it mean it's free? Yes and no, right? Uh, some open source software is free. If you want a community version, you just pick up something from the internet, download it and use it. Perfectly fine, perfectly possible, understand the risks. If you want something that you want to feel safe, I want to attribute the risk to someone else or the liability to someone else, that's where the vendors come in, buy the open source product uh, that these guys ship, right? Um, and the costs usually are associated with products, but Costs can also be associated with projects as well in terms of the engineering effort that you'll need to put in to mitigate the risk that you're absorbing within the organization, All right? Another misconception, do I only deploy open source software on open source software? No, right? You can deploy non-open source or proprietary software on open source software as well, right? There are many examples out there, SAP, uh, is one big example, Oracle, another example, all of their platforms run on open source solutions like Linux, uh, as an example. It does not mean that if I want to use open source platforms like Linux, Kubernetes, so on and so, uh, so forth, right? I need to open source my software. No, it does not mean that, right? You can if you want to, but you don't have to, right? Um, the one thing about consuming open source software is that depending on the open source license, right? If you do make change to the source code, right, uh, you might need to attribute those changes back into the open source community in that particular project. You might need to do that if you change the source code. But if you don't change the source code, you just take it, compile it, run it, then no, you don't have to do that, right? Um, and the last one, I guess, is a big topic uh, uh, of today's session is open source safe. Right, and and this is very interesting because uh, uh, I always enjoy this particular story, right? Uh, and this was when I first joined Red Hat, and I was doing a executive brief uh, at an event for another vendor, and Red Hat was a partner in, to that vendor. Um, and I was doing this event, and this guy came up, and I was talking about Linux and how open source and Linux, you know, was the way to go. This, once again, this was 14 years ago. Uh, and this guy came up and he actually said this one thing. Uh, no, but open source is insecure. How can we use it, right? Even if you buy it from Red Hat, uh, it's still insecure. Everyone can look at the source code. I'm like, isn't the whole point security by transparency uh, more important, right? You actually see what you get, right? Versus something that you don't see and you don't know what's inside. But guess what? The internet has all the holes and you can't even fix it, right? Um, you talk about security by transparency versus security by obscurity. Uh, security by transparency almost always wins because there are more eyes looking at the software to actually make the software more secure. Once again, all software contain bugs, right? That's, that's clear. There's, there's no such thing as a perfect piece of software. Uh, maybe in some, you know, utopian world there is, but in reality, most software or all software, I would say, probably contain one bug or another, right? It's really how these bugs are identified and addressed, uh, and that's what counts. Uh, the vendors, once again, uh, like what I explained earlier, they take the accountability for 
open source software, right? Whether it's a large software, small software, but they take the accountability to actually address those security issues and bugs, right? And they should be held accountable for it. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of talk of trace together, right? And, and I think uh, it really, to quote uh, a certain um, a member of, uh, well, now a certain MP, it warms the cockles of my heart uh, to see that the Singapore government uh, uh, actually did an uh, awesome initiative uh, to release uh, the Blue Trace protocol um, and basically trace together the app uh, for contact tracing, right, uh, as an open source project. Uh, it was something that was very, very impressive. And it was something that uh, I felt that, well, it's a po extremely positive step uh, that what the government did, right, releasing it uh, for the greater good of, of mankind worldwide, right. And truth to be said, uh, more than 50 countries were actually expressing interest to use the app or download the app and use it. Uh, and source code and actually people like Australia, New Zealand, and even the Czech Republic have actually launched it in production, which is actually a pretty cool testament to the open source model in the first place, right? Um, the real impact, right, uh, of open source in this, open source and security in this particular project, right, in the Blue, Blue Trace project, um, is that number one, these countries, right, had faster releases. They didn't have to develop from scratch. Right? They just took the code and they ran with it. So for them to release it to market was very, very quick. That's one. Number two, transparent code releases. If the code release was, the code release was transparent and as such, people could examine it from a security point of view. Right? And to make sure that you know, people are not being tracked and stuff like that. Um, and once again, this would reassure from a privacy angle. Right, what uh, the entire thing, uh, what the software is, right? I'm assured that you know I'm not being tracked. I'm. It gives me that sort of reassurance, even though I cannot read the source code as a citizen, right? And maybe I'm not equipped to read the source code. But if you talk about other people who have actually examined the source code and they validate that it is actually independent, yeah, independent validation, right? That it's actually safe. Uh, that actually reassures a lot of the people as well, right? And of course, there's no own self-check, own self-check, uh, or no, no own self-check, own self uh, mentality here, right? Uh, which of course is a uh, important thing. Um, of course, what can we improve, right? Um, I think while we did an awesome job of releasing this in an open source manner, what I personally think is that if development of trace together continued in the open source space, right? We could have actually harnessed active collaboration from other countries and other agencies uh, to actually innovate better features, better traceability, better accountability, better security, right? And I know for a fact that uh, there are multiple agencies worldwide, uh, including some uh, prestigious universities uh, in the US that are willing to collaborate uh, with uh, Singapore on this, which would, be, which would be really, really great, right? Uh, as is, Trace Together was only open sourced for its initial version. Uh, and, and that's an interesting thing, right? Uh, follow on, the development happened uh, behind closed doors and it was not contributed back. But that said, we are hoping that this will change. And oh, I, at least I'm hoping that this personally, this will change and actually help uh, uh, in terms of um, putting it back, contribution back into the open source space so that we can actually genuinely form a global community to actually develop the software together. And that is something that I would really look forward to, right? Um, uh, once again, the benefits of this we have already seen once, but I think we can continue to harness this uh, benefit uh, for uh, the greater good uh, of society, right? Um, and once again, we get the benefits as well. More developers, more eyes looking at it, we get the benefits as well. We get more features into our own app that we can then release uh, to us as citizens, um, which of course is beneficial to us all. If you talk about beyond trace together, what more can be done? Uh, I would definitely encourage further apps uh, that, being, that are being developed to be done in the open source space. Once again, uh, if you think short term, maybe you know, uh, uh, people are protective, they're shy, they don't want to share their code. Uh, but once you overcome that, if your project is attractive enough, people will join forces together. Um, Red Hat even has an initiative here to actually uh, 
publicize projects related to COVID-19 um, and attract contributions from multiple organizations worldwide, right? And I'd love to see uh, Trace Together to be on that list. Okay, that's all for me. I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Mayhui. Okay, thanks, Siva. So, um, I'm Meihui from GovTech. As uh, Xiaofei mentioned, I'm from the cybersecurity group and my team does cybersecurity operations and engineering. So, mainly helping government agency uh, backend. Uh, cyber security acts of open source. And for some of the points, I think Siva highlighted are uh, quite important for us to take note, which is that the main benefit of course of open source is that there's a lot of open collaboration because there's large group of expertise from all over the world, not just from the main team that's developing the code. They are contributing back to this ecosystem. So in terms of the maintenance of the code, if there's any security issues that are spotted, of course, it can be very quickly validated and also identified and fixed. And uh, as compared to if you are talking about the converse is that closed source, so um, closed source could be slower depending on which vendor you use or also the nature of the code and the software you're using. And in terms of uh, the legal usage, because there's actually different types of uh, usage that open source can be applied to. So I probably, I also won't go into detail, but uh, there are certain open source code that may be restricted for commercial purposes. Like you can use for personal use or you don't modify the code, but you're not supposed to be profiting out of it. So these are also things that you need to take off. And of course, any vulnerabilities or bug spotted also need to be reported back to the author. So some of the, I would say that these are the benefits, of course, that it keeps the code refreshed and updated as well. And yeah, so uh, there are a few different risks though, uh, things that you need to take off, of course, when using open source, because it's not a key that can be applied to every situation. So one of the highlights is that you cannot also assume that the code is always maintained because there could be software that has been outdated and not fixed for a long time. So if you are going to use it, you also have to use uh, due diligence. And if you want to apply it to certain specific applications that could be regulated, you also have to take note that because perhaps that there are also different organizations or even countries that have their own, um, I would say, regulations for software or privacy. So do take note of those things as well when you are using the open source code. And of the uh, uh, components that the component any security flaw updated, of course, may not be kind of in a sense updated as quickly, or it may be updated in another module. So due diligence is also required when you are using code, and also you need to upkeep some of the software yourself. And the third point I'll highlight is that there may not be documentation available that readily. So this, of course, is dependent on what open source code you use. Like for some of the very well-established software, like um, an example I'll give is Firefox. So both in and the documentations are available. And if you are developing add-ons to it, it's very seamless and you can just be on your own and contribute back so give and take of course it depends on the application and if you are using it for a more commercial purpose then there are much more to take note of of course because of it, especially if you are transmitting or holding a lot of data yeah so yeah so some of the tips that i think we would cover also during the later part of our session so definitely please use your code with due diligence because more sensitive and critical application, you still need an internal security team. So it's not that uh, I would say that you can rely totally on the open source community to fix every bug or every flaw that's available because uh, one, it may not be picked out quickly or if you discover it yourself, you can also contribute back to the community. 
and uh, maintenance of code is something that we should always do uh, from an engineering perspective, of course, because uh, even for any code that is being developed by vendors or internally, if it's outdated and not fixed, definitely there will be things that need to be changed and also be kept up. And for, uh, as I came, I actually came from uh, IT and security audit background. So uh, to me, one of the highlights is that uh, actually internal record and log of code version, any changes used uh, that is being made to your software should be actually recorded quite uh, diligently because even in terms of software that is being updated by external means because this could contribute back to some of the uh, in, in future if there's any audit issues these are actually very very important documentation so uh, of course do take note if you are using all these and uh, definitely from my perspective, I would suggest that, uh, as Siva mentioned, there are actually companies that use open source and help you to you know, maintain and, and apply the code into a completed product. So that could be a more feasible route for certain applications. But this, of course, doesn't guarantee that the, the whole thing would be, in a sense, free. So only the code and the software part will be free, but any maintenance and updates would still contribute to a cost. So that's a bit of a give and take. Yeah. So I would now um, like to over the time much more on some of the talking points. Yep. Um, thanks, Meihui. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Richard. I hope you can all hear me fine. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Xiaopei and Matthias for inviting me to be, you know, uh, joining this session as well as part of the panelists. Um, I've I spent quite a fair bit of time, you know, um, having worked in Red Hats for the, uh, you know, for eight years, uh, looking at how open source actually changed, you know, in terms of uh, the landscape within the enterprises, right? So I'd like to talk a little bit more in terms of what is the state of open source adoption, right, uh, in this part of the world and also globally, yeah. Okay, first and foremost, I think in the recent years, you know, as many of you would have witnessed, right, um, there's very strong adoption, right, of cloud as well as open source technologies in the enterprises. I would like to argue that, you know, these two are the key technologies that is sort of like a game changer, right, for the enterprise in terms of how they actually try to make use of um, technologies to deliver even greater value to the business, right? To make it more agile, to help business to drive uh, digital transformation. And uh, the, the reason is very simple, right? So if you look at the cloud, right? So basically what the cloud does is to simplify the consumption of technology, right? Uh, previously, you know, if you work in large enterprises in the IT, you will realize that it takes months and months before you can actually roll out new projects, right? So first you have to order the hardware, which takes like weeks and months uh, for delivery. And then you have to be involved in lengthy commercial negotiation with your partners and vendors just to make sure that, you know, uh, you can actually uh, roll out this project uh, quickly. Yeah? Uh, but that has changed, right? Uh, with the introduction of cloud, right? Uh, be it infrastructure as a service or software as a service, right? So all that people need. Uh, in fact, the project team needs is basically to go to the cloud service, open an account, maybe plug in their credit cards and start trying out different technologies. So this has uh, really reduced the kind of friction in terms of allowing people to try out different set of technologies and make a uh, better informed decision right before they actually uh, uh, invest in a longer term commitment. So that is really changing the landscape quite a fair bit. And in a similar fashion, if you look at open source, right? Basically, what open source does is to make innovation truly accessible to everyone. Right? When I say everyone, it, it li literally means it, right? Um, it's unlike the traditional way in which software was being built proprietary, right? So um, only a few vendors control this technology. And in order to have access to it, you have to pay them chunks of money, right? So which is obviously quite difficult uh, depending on um, which sector, which industry you're working for, right? Uh, and Today, right, with uh, open source, enterprises have access to cutting edge tools and I, and I really mean cutting edge tools, right? Tools that are used by the digital natives, you know? um, If you look at DBS, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have heard about, you know, DBS in the news for being uh, a very innovative and progressive digital bank, right? Uh, DBS started 
uh, this project called Project Gandalf, right? Uh, named after the uh, famous wizard in uh, Lord of the Rings, right? So Gandalf is basically an acronym, uh, you know, of Google, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, LinkedIn, and Facebook, with the D missing, right? So the D stands for DBS Bank. So basically, uh, uh, DBS Bank, you know, led by uh, Piyush and uh, Dave Led you, their ambition was to become a technology company with a banking license, right? So basically they see that digital banking is going to transform the way in which their customers work with the banks. So that's banking become part of their life and not ruling their life, right? So, and you know, you can see that uh, obviously they have been very successful in the recent years uh, by the number of awards that they have won, right? Uh, you know, globally, yeah. So jumping into uh, the slides, yeah. Um, I've taken out some you know, data extracted from the state of the uh, enterprise open source uh, reports, you know, just released earlier this year. Um, basically, it shows, you know, in terms of the adoption for both cloud and open source, right? So, 63% um, of the IT leaders, right, uh, surveyed, right, said that they have a hybrid cloud infrastructure today, right? Uh, that being said, right, for those that doesn't have it, you know, 54% of them, right, are looking at implementing or having a plan to implement it within the next 24 months. Okay. On the right hand side, you'll see that 83% of IT leaders says enterprise open source has been instrumental in their organization's ability to take advantage of cloud architecture. So, you know, you, you can see from here that there's actually a strong correlation between open source and the cloud. And in the near future, right, so these two set of technology will continue to grow, you know, hand in hand. Yeah. But where are all these open source um, technology being uh, used, right? So uh, in the same survey, you know, it was found that actually open source software is being used um, in areas like security, cloud management tools, database, big data, and analytics. So these are the four uh, key areas. And usually they are part of the enterprise initiative to do IT modernization, or IT infrastructure modernization, you know, to build cloud native applications as part of the, the application development efforts, and also um, embedded as part of the uh, DevOps tool chains and processes. Yeah. So you will see that there, there are percentages being thrown around, you know, on the charts. Um, but basically, there are definitely uh, differences, right, between how different countries or different regions, uh, you know, uh, adopt open source in terms of their pace. But in general, I would say that. Um, uh, for APEC, right, uh, the, the pace and which the extent to which we adopt uh, open source uh, compares pretty favorably, right, across the different regions, right. In fact, we are actually uh, a little bit more aggressive in terms of adopting open source, for example, right, DevOps, you know, and cloud management tools, yeah. So, in short, I, I think uh, this is not only a Singapore or uh, Asia Pacific uh, kind of phenomenon, uh, this is actually a global phenomenon which you know, in itself is actually encouraging each other globally, right, to be involved, uh, to be involved in this whole uh, change in terms of the uh, technology paradigm, yeah. Okay, so what's next for open source, right? Um, we have seen enterprises using a lot of uh, cloud and open source over the past few years, uh, but I would say that, you know, this is actually still the early stages, right? So the reason is because um, so far, while many organizations are already using uh, these uh, mentioned technologies, uh, it is pretty much either in the pilot stage or they have already gone uh, into production for newer set of applications, right? That actually helps the business to move into um, the digital uh, platform, yeah? So that being said, right, uh, you know that actually enterprises have existed for decades, right? And definitely there are a lot of um, legacies uh, that is being built across uh, the years of technology uh, and you know uh, in fact most of the uh, core transactional systems are still pretty much on-prem sitting in the data center running proprietary software uh, that's why you know that the, the future is uh, looking very bright in terms of increasing adoption of both cloud and open source technologies and you know, in the next few years, we do see open source as playing a very important role in some of these key areas, like for example, software delivery and deployment. Right? Um, do expect to see more um, open source technology or and even new ones, right? That is being developed in the space of DevOps, 
you know, to help uh, build cloud native applications and services, and also forming as part of your hybrid cloud infrastructure. On top of that, you know, with the proliferation of uh, connectivity, you know, with 5G coming into the uh, picture, with a lot of IoT devices, with autonomous uh, transportation that is, you know, uh, in the pipeline, right? We do see um, areas like automation, security, big data and analytics continue to be a very hot space. And definitely when there's big problems, you know, to be solved, the community will actually rally behind and create solutions that actually help to address um, all these issues. Yeah. And last but not least, you know, I, I mentioned about how the community coming in to resolve issues, right? Um, today, by and large, most enterprises are basically users of open source technology, right? But we do have seen some, you know, uh, more advanced users uh, appreciating the value of them getting um, engaged with the open source community, right? So uh, getting engaged uh, through the ways of maybe, you know, providing ideas of how problems can be resolved or even you know, writing new codes right, to fix problems and contributing it back to the community. So this kind of engagement is actually um, very beneficial. It's, it's a virtuous cycle, right? As more people realize the benefits of not only using open source, but also contributing back to the community, this will encourage others to do likewise. And, and it's a virtuous cycle in a sense that as a whole, when more people contribute to the community, right, everybody benefits. And I would say that in the coming years, um, there's uh, the, the open source, you know, innovation is likely going to be driven by more users, right? Um, for a start, right, you see companies like um, Google, you know, um, like uh, Microsoft contributing to um, the open source projects, you know, uh, by releasing all these source codes to help the community. But I, I would say that, you know, it's time uh, that we have even more engagements from the enterprise users, right, contributing because they are the ones who is actually living with a lot of all these challenges that they are trying to resolve. And they, they definitely have the brains to really uh, uh, fix some of this problem and make it work better, contributing back to the uh, community. So anyway, in short, this is how uh, we, we see, you know, open source coming into the uh, picture the next few years, right, definitely, we'll be seeing more of uh, this technology, right. Okay. Um, with that, I would like to uh, pass it back to Matthias, you know, for the uh, panel discussion. Matthias? Thank you so much. Well, I think that was a great session. Uh, a lot of different perspective of open source and uh, I felt that the panelists have addressed some of the key issues.